Shane Hazel's with me today, and we're going to have a two-part episode with him. The first is going to be about his rescue and support mission in lieu of Hurricane Helene. It's going to be some wild stories about his interactions with people in North Carolina, Georgia, the Green Berets, and FEMA. You don't want to miss this. The second episode, we're going to have him break down his time as a Georgia governor candidate and his perspective of the upcoming election. Let's get into it. You find those who have not had freedom uh, and not in a position to define freedom, they're beginning to define it for themselves now. And as they get in a position intellectually to define freedom for themselves, they see that they don't have it. And it makes them less peaceful. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice. Monetary debasement is out of control. Runaway debt like an animated snowball. The only question is, do you want to take the steps to get out of the way? Or do you become a casualty to parasitic greed? So, so I'm not a self promoter, you know, I'm not a salesman. Uh, you know, I'm fatally meritocratic, uh, you know, but I'll say that you are the only person I've ever asked to go on their show. I remember it was Bitcoin 23, um, out after, after the, the, the shooting at the, the Bitcoin shooters, uh, class that we had, I said, Hey, can we, can we have a little time? I wanted to talk to you, get to know you. Um, but I just wanted to talk to someone in a formal setting, uh, who I felt was a model of unyielding ethical motivation and determination. And there aren't really that many people out there like that, you know? And so I wanted to be associated with you, bro, because even if just for an hour, and and it was. And so now you're on my show, Shane Hazel, you're a combat veteran of Marine Force Reconnaissance, podcast host of Radical and Bitcoin Veterans, uh, the 2022 Georgia governor candidate, entrepreneur, homeschooler, homesteader. And I can't think of too many folks that would that I'd want to talk to twice as long as everyone else. So so welcome. And is there anything else that um that you'd like the audience to know about you before we get started? Uh big fan of Ulrich, man. I'll tell you that. Uh, <laughs> no, you make me blush, man. That's uh no, it's, it's great to see you and hang out with you again. I, was, uh, I, I I light up every time I see you. You're one of the first people I actually met in Bitcoin. And, uh, you know, to to have that warm welcome. I mean, you were rolling around, I think, um, at the time with Anders and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. those guys. And, you know, it was just a, a great afternoon of, you know, kind of getting together and having some good laughs and talking Bitcoin and, you know, kind of feeling the whole space out. So I, I appreciate the warm welcome. Awesome, man. And, uh, and, and it's mutual. That was back in 22. Um, and it's like, I remember seeing you. I had to just stop you. It's like, you're Shane Hazel. And it was like. And you need, you have the muscles going, you know, special forces, and you know, you need better I, like, heroes, <laughs> <laughs> dude. I'm telling you, the, the the humility of this space in general. Um, I think it's it's getting weird during the bull market, but um, we can talk about that later. But I will say that you're one of those guys who, um, despite you know the world around you, you stay firm to who you are. Um, and I think that leads into um, what you've been doing recently. Um, you're from Georgia mm-hmm. and you oh, have the dual pri- go ahead. Yeah. I, 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 I was born in Michigan. I grew up in, in Georgia. I live up there yeah. in the North Georgia mountains now. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I don't, I, I, what I meant to say, yeah, that's where you call your home now. So, yeah. so you are, you are, you call your home Georgia now and you know, you have the dual privilege and obligation to support that home, uh, in hurricane Helene's relief. Mm-hmm. What was that like having boots on the ground and witness it all firsthand. So, um, you know, in North Georgia, uh, we, we got some damage. It wasn't, it wasn't terrible. Um, it, we had the eye of the storm actually pass right over our house. Um, and we had, you know, slight wind damage in the area, uh, power was out for a little while. 
no major interruptions, thank God. I was, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I was very nervous um, when I started hearing some of the reports that were coming in from Savannah, which was not predicted to get hit at all. And then to see the line that it was tracking through flooding up, you know, that corridor, um, I was, it, it was weird, you know, it was one of those things where you're like, oh man, you know, thank God it's not us. But at the same time, you're sitting there watching people absolutely get, you know, obliterated, not only by torrential rain and winds, but then you have uh, a lot of tornadoes in terms of spinoff. And so, um, you know, that, that, I guess that early morning on Friday, I think it was when, um, you know, we're, we all slept in the basement that night just to make sure, you know, uh, it, that everything was going to be okay. It was about 6 a.m. when it really kind of hit us, and it, it, it was, you know, it was bad. Um, some trees cracking and things like that. But the, you know, the the, the bigger, you know, picture, uh, you know, we got we got scratch compared to you know the the real devastation. Um, and you know, kind of fast forward, I guess a couple of days, we start hearing that there's n nobody showing up in North Carolina parts of Georgia, South Carolina, like there's just no response. And I kind of just looked at my wife and said, I got to go. Um, and she said, I know. So, um, it sounds like a movie, man. <laughs> dude. Well, you know, I, like you said, I, I was that guy that rushed off after nine 11. I was about to enter my fourth year of, um, of, you know, college and I was 21 years old and I was like, man, college will be there if I get back. So I got to go. Right. It's like, somebody has got to go. Um, somebody who's going to be, you know, a, an asset, not, not a liability who has some know-how for a lot of different situations, who understands, you know, emergency situations, understands trauma, understands shock, understands, you know, what needs to be done in those situations. And, um, you know, I just kind of call up my guys over at Bitcoin veterans is like, look, we got to put something together. This is my plan. I'm going up to North Carolina. I'm going to find some key leaders up there. Uh, we're going to start doing force multiplication and get these guys the supplies they need to start getting their community back up and running. And, that was, you know, it's, it's, it's a thought, right? It's like, this, this is the thought. And then, you know, then comes the task of putting it into, you know, actual action and, you know, completely different things. So, you know, a lot of, I think a lot of people get stuck at, you know, this is my concept and then they get, you know, paralyzed by the amount of work that's actually in front of them, what, you know, what steps they need to take. Whereas, you know, having been there and done this kind of stuff, you know, not, not disaster, but just, you know, preparing to go do something, um, you know, your, my experiences, I guess, in, in that background just kind of lend itself towards doing stuff. And, you know, bigger picture, and we were kind of talking before the show, um, you know, there are times when God speaks to you um, and you better listen, you know, it's like, if you don't, you know, you, you're that person that, you know, lives with things later on in life that you wish you would have done. And I kind of, I don't know how old I was when I kind of vowed to myself, you know, don't be, don't be that guy, like be that guy. Who's like, if you make it to 80 years old, um, you, you're, you're the grandfather on the porch that just has loads of stories, maybe, you know, not so smart stories sometimes, but, um, stories about, you know, how, you know, what you did and, you know, when, when it mattered most, I think that's probably, you know, one of those pieces of advice my grandfather gave to me is like, hey, man, like you if you want your life to matter, you're going to have to do some things. Right. And so when when the time calls and it feels, you know, kind of weird um, or you feel pulled, listen to it. You know, that's assuming that people actually have a conscience to begin with. You know, it's amazing how, you know, people will silence that call to action um, because of selfish selfishness, uh, because of uh all different because of distractions because of fiat all different types of things uh that take us away from being human and i think that you you hit the nail on the head on that one shane while you were out there um helping out these people what were your actual mission objectives so um you know like i said um one of the th first things that I thought is, you know, to get this community back up and running, you're going to have to identify key leaders uh, in, in in this area. Mostly, most of the time, like, it, and when you go into a disaster area um, or any type of shock and trauma area, what you're trying to, to do is establish trust. Um, this happened in, you know, and I say, and I don't mean this the way people are going to take it at first and I'll explain. This probably happened in the best area 
possible in, in terms of the devastation and destruction. Um, and, I, and I'll explain. Um, so the North Carolina mountains um, and, and, and really the Appalachians are just filled with guys from special forces, especially the Green Beret. Um, the Green Beret's mission uh, is to do force multiplication basically with nothing, with indigenous people on non-permissive soil. And I know that's a lot of jargon. Um, so if, you, if there's any you know, question about what it is, um, and the thing is, is they train there. They, they, they literally train Green Beret in the North Carolina mountains. Uh, and I got to spend some time in 2004 with those guys when uh, Donald Rumsfeld said, you guys over in Force Reconnaissance and Reconnaissance are going to, or, or Battalion Reconnaissance, you're going to contribute to the soft mission because, or special operations missions, because we were not part of soft. We were strictly the Marine Corps. So um, my team of, you know, six uh, guys went over with a ODA group, uh, Operational Detachment Alpha Green Berets uh, on a compound in Najaf. And we started to learn, um, you know, how operations worked and what, you know, the bigger uh, picture was for those guys and force multiplication, um, you know, working with the indigenous population to kind of influence events in those areas. I mean, that's obviously what we do. It sounds a little paramilitary. Uh, they work with agency guys and so things like that over there. So, it, you know, it is, but it's, it's also a place where, you know, you start to see, you know, who these men are, who are Green Beret and, um, you know, their, their mission is to, to free people and to have, you know, guys like that crawling all over the hills out there. I was like, you know, they're there. I, I got to go out there. I got to find them. They're, they're going to stick out like a sore thumb because they're going to be the guys out helping everybody else. So you start asking around. Um, and so, uh, hats off to Jordan. Um, you know, Jordan Gambrell is another, uh, green brewery. He's one of the founding five of the Bitcoin veterans. Uh, as I'm doing this, he's my point of contact because with limited comms, like we had no internet, we had no cell coverage. We, we, we didn't even have power out there. We had no water. Um, I said, Hey man, when I have communications, I need a single point of communication, you know, and he, because he's who he is, he obviously understands, you know, what the mission is. So I broke away, got up there as fast as possible. And the first thing I got is you need to find these guys over in Burnsville, North Carolina. They're called the Christian Rangers. Uh, they were headed up by a guy named Micah Dumford and met up with his team. Uh, the first night I got out there it was Sunday when I got there. And I will tell you right now, um, you know, the, 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 you could smell the death in the air. Like you literally roll into town and smell the death in the valleys. It was pungent. Um, and, you know, you knew you were in a different kind of apocalyptic type, you know, situation at that point for some people. So I uh, linked up with these guys, uh, you know, credit to them. They had been doing search and rescue for days at that point. Um, and, you know, that was the first mission to do search and rescue. Uh, establish a base of operations, uh, start coordinating all of the supplies and, and volunteers that wanted to come in and help. Uh, and, and my mission was to start setting up communications for those people when I went up there. So um, obviously, Bitcoin Veterans is all about Bitcoin, but it's all about Freedom Tech as well. So when we start talking Freedom Tech, we're talking about decentralized um, you know, communication a lot of times. One of the you know great things that uh, a guy named Gary, who is a, a big part of our team and contributes a lot, uh, Gary Kraus, he is he's a phenomenal guy. Um, and he works, I guess, over at Marathon, but he introduced us to Mesh Tastic. And Mesh Tastic is one of those things where you know you take your phone and match it with a, a tiny little radio, and now you can start setting up nodes in a point to point mesh network where you've got redundancy and everything else. So um, when I rolled into town, the first place I got to stop with these guys was a uh, helicopter landing zone, HLZ. And we were going to go in, grab some supplies. I found out that the guy who lived there was a Green Beret. And, you know, when you find out that the guy's a Green Beret and, you know, this guy knows some things, he knows some people, I'm sure he's fairly instrumental. Let's get him anything and everything that we can. So. I brought my own personal emergency Starlink. Uh, had you know a bunch of mesh tastics with me. I had some generators, and that uh, that morning when I rolled up and said, "Hey, it's you know, it, it's go time," I said, "Hey, can you use any of these things?" He's like, "I could use all of these things and then some." 
And I want to cut you off real quick before we sure. get too far from the mesh, mesh tastic. Um, what's the range on that uh, point to point? Is it 200 meters? Is this the same thing I've heard of before? So mesh tastic uh, interfaces with your phone through Bluetooth, but it interfaces on the 915 uh, megahertz uh, strain. So it's an open uh, strain, and you know, depending on the antenna and how much wattage you're pushing. Um, you can you can really push out with the little radios that we have. I've done over thirty miles uh, line okay. of sight already, um, and I, I won't spoil the good stuff for you know later on. But we did some com shots after we set up some nodes out there that blow your mind. Um, so these are this is real technology. This isn't like you know rinky dink stuff. This is you know this is how you can survive. You can survive off of this type of technology. It's real emergency technology, and that's the thing mm -hmm. is when you need to get communications to somebody, you can literally text somebody through this, and it's you know it's normal interface text. So if you are trapped, if you need supplies, if you need to do what you know E and E emergency evacuation. And you need to set up, um, you know, what we call a DAR point, like where you're going to meet up. You can do all of these things. You can call for, you know, uh, you know, helicopter landing zones. You know, you can bring birds in. You can, if you can communicate through text, somebody can get that text who actually has real comms to somebody else. And now you've got this two-way street of communication, and nothing can stop this. You know, that's that's the thing. And unless unless a repeater gets taken down or something like that. Nothing can stop this, and they're very easy to deploy. It reminds me of the uh, the movie um, Return of the King, where they started uh, Lord of the Rings: Return of the King, where they started lighting lighting the uh, lighting the fires on top of the mountain, and it's like you know it just starts repeating, and it's like hey, you know, call in the reinforcements, and it's like that's right. That technology we don't realize we're so privileged in this world, in this Western world, um, you know, covered by the 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 protection of the of the money printer. We don't realize how important these types of technologies are. We don't realize how important Bitcoin is. Um, these types of um, that this technology that keep that doesn't need this central force, this central shadowy entity to keep things all afloat. Because when that entity is gone, um, you still have to live. You still have to get from point A to point B. You still have to get that message from point A to point B, um, which leads me to another question. But before I go, because I can get into some theory crafting and some some other stuff, is there anything else you wanted to talk about with the with the Green Beret that you met? Yeah, um, I think the ahead. force multiplication factor is something that everybody should understand um, because it will also determine who you are in an emergency situation. So, um, you know, what we're looking for is human force multiplication. It, it kind of refers to the enhancement of an individual's capabilities, his effectiveness through collaboration, technology, strategic uh, resource allocation, leading uh, of the overall, you know, impact and productivity of an area, right? So imagine, you know, you're going out and trying to find these people, you know, in, in your mind, are you looking for Peter Griffin or are you looking for Batman? And, you know, I, to paint that like kind of that stark contrast is like i want i want batman right i want that guy who is a doer i want the guy that is already an asset he's got a bunch of know-how in terms of you know communications and 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 just you know movement in a disaster area he understands uh, all sorts of technologies out there and he's not just looking out for himself because he's way past that already in, in a survival situation he's looking to help other people so that's that's something i think most people should think about, are you going to be an asset or are you going to be a liability in a disaster situation? Because if you're an asset, then you can go out there and save lives. All right. You set yourself up for this one because you, you gave me two, two uh, okay. icons, two representations. You gave me Peter Griffin. You gave me Batman. And even though podcasts, you know, you're supposed to ask, you know, questions that, you know, can give flowery responses. I want a one word answer. Okay. Uh -oh. FEMA. Peter Griffin or Batman? On extremes, I know, but you got to pick. If you had to pick one, gun to your head. Yeah, FEMA. You're you're going to be Peter Griffin. I mean, okay. Peter Griffin's okay. waiting on on FEMA, man. Okay, so no, no, no. So hold on, no, no. Is FEMA <laughs> Peter Griffin or? <laughs> Or, or no, do you, you want to abstain? No, Peter, abstain? Peter, Peter Griffin at least makes me laugh. I mean, <laughs> I told you I broke my ribs. Hold on, I didn't expect you. 
<laughs> Maybe I'm making myself laugh. Oh, okay, I feel bad. I've broken tons of ribs, and it's never fun. This is my uh, first one. It was a basketball injury. But so, so you're saying FEMA is P Peter Griffin. Peter Griffin, FEMA. Like FEMA's down okay. here, man. I got uh, you. Okay, right, right. And that's that's fine. That's fair. That's fair. I, and there, there, there's again, even in the state, there is some value. It's just that the the inefficiencies of the state tend to overwhelm um, the people that actually bring value. So I wanted to talk about FEMA a little bit sure. um, because that was that was a hot topic uh, during the, both of those storms. But it, I mean, even when you look up FEMA right now, like you can see Google partnering with them uh, to establish a defense for mis dis malinformation on their efforts. I mean, you go to their website, or I'm sorry, you just search. FEMA or you search the storm and immediately it says uh, rumors about FEMA or rumors about Hurricane Milton or, or Hurricane Helene. Uh, so you were there. What was your understanding of the negative and positive impacts uh, of FEMA? So I, I will tell you, I never saw them. Um, and I, I can't tell you, you know, I probably drove over a thousand miles in those mountains and then some, maybe, maybe 2000. Um, never saw FEMA. I got secondhand accounts from firsthand accounts. So um, I, I heard they were taking people's property. Um, you know, as soon as you got into a relationship with them, they were confiscating materials and, and assets and, and warehouses full of supplies. I mean, literally taking whole warehouses. Um, they tried to stop some people. One of them, one of them made the mistake of, you know, trying to pull jurisdiction out there in the mountains and he got beat up a little bit. Um, mm. You know, they they didn't they didn't kill him or anything. They asked him to politely leave. And when he got belligerent, they said, enough is enough. You will leave or we will we will help you leave. Um, and at that point, they helped him leave. So um, the, the worst part about this is, you know, what they've done is they've set up a preferential system um, where and let's just call them disaster welfare whores um, because I don't want to mention any of these groups by name. There's no need to. They know who they are. Uh, disaster <laughs> welfare whores are people who literally chase disasters around who are approved by the federal government to work on the jobs that need to get done in those areas. Now, this comes with millions, if not billions of dollars. And the, the ugly side of this that nobody talks about is when this happens, um, the volunteers who have stepped in the gap and done quick reaction, you know, like a QRF, uh, quick reaction force, they've stepped in the gap, they've, they've started, you know, the supplies, they've started the coordination of supplies, they've started the coordination of key leaders in the area, standing up, those guys up, empowering them, and then automating the process in, in the interim while providing security for everybody, not as extremist organized militias, but just to make sure that these things aren't taken by people who are bad actors in the area. And there are plenty of those, including human sex traffickers. Um, what, what begins to happen is now they won't operate in that area. So imagine, if you will, a bunch of special forces guys and their amazing volunteer force has come out there and done so much for that uh, for that population, that the population falls in love with them. I mean, absolutely falls in love with them to the point where when a sheriff or a mayor is asked by a governor or let's say somebody higher, a uh, senator, congressman, something like that, saying, you have to get rid of these volunteers or we are not sending any money to your area to work on projects. Well, how do we do that? Well, if you have a if you have a sheriff now that's going to try to kick out the people that have been helping these guys, they're not going to win re-election, and that you know that obviously means something. And I can tell you right now, we met with sheriffs departments, we met with fire departments, we met with mayors, we we met and and we're attending a whole bunch of these emergency meetings out there. Uh, you know, every morning uh, and and getting the brief and disseminating the brief and making sure that we were not in their way that we were only assets to the situation on hand. And then the federal government goes, well, maybe, or even the state government at some levels says, well, maybe we need to start a smear campaign. So this is where you start to hear things that are all secondhand accounts with no video, no audio, no proof whatsoever. Um, things like, 
you know, these guys are extremist militia. These guys are satanic. They're not actually Christians. These guys, you know, are, are luring women out into the woods that are never coming back again. The female volunteers are going missing. When you start to hear this kind of stuff in your area, and listen, people are in shock still. This is weeks later. People are still in shock. They have been traumatized. You know, they are scared for maybe, you know, their, their, not only their well-being, but their welfare going forward. Like, what what's going to happen? And how are we going to rebuild this situation? These guys don't have billions of dollars, you know, to come in here and, and rebuild our, our county or our towns. Um and if they're bad actors and they're, they've just been, you know, coming in here and doing all this, uh, you know, you know, I guess acting, so to speak, how can we trust them? We don't we don't really know these people. And that's what they do. They plant that seed of doubt. They start to sow fear. And, you know, that lower part of people's brains, they go back into into protection mode. And that fear is one of those things that is crippling. Luckily for us, um, these these mountains out here are filled with people that have distrusted and not wanted to be around the government, uh, even at the local level, for a very very long time. And so their distrust of those guys is even higher. You know, when you when you're climbing mountains and cutting people out of their homes and their driveways, and you know, getting them you know supplies and everything else, like that's a that's a that's an act, and that's one of those things where. You know, a lot of times you don't go down those driveways in the mountains. You don't you're not showing up at somebody's property, you know, without having some sort of firearm, you know, you know, put in your face. And so to be accepted, to be able to drive down driveways and, and meet with people versus how the government is still received, it's still not working for them. You know, there are some people that will try to spread those rumors. But it, at, at the end of the day, um, that's who the federal government is. That's who the state government is in a lot of cases. Um, and it all boils down to a bad incentive structure, which brings us right back to Bitcoin. It's mm -hmm. you know, if we had a better incentive structure, um, like what we were able to provide and, and very like go out and prove, you know, through proof of work, we can we can get things done that those guys can't get done in months within days. We can do so with more potency where we're not soaking up local resources like hotel rooms that these people need to, you know, put their lives back together because they don't have a house anymore. FEMA's staying in hotel rooms. They are staying in Airbnbs. You know, they're they're staying in all these places that could be used to rent out for people who are displaced while, you know, the the guys on the ground, the veterans and their volunteers are they're camping in tents in a parking lot that's on a slant in freezing weather. They're sleeping in the back of their pickup trucks. Maybe they got lucky and they, you know, found a house down the road that is not quite finished and is under construction and they and, and the construction uh owner, the guy who owns the construction site is gracious enough to let us sleep there in the middle of the night to keep the rain off of us and and things like that so that's that's the difference between the proof of work that bitcoin offers the incentive structure offers uh proof of work offers versus you know throw money at it in a fiat system offers and, and it's really important to denote another thing. You know, sometimes, you know, no coiners or or people stuck in this fiat world says, oh, well, when you say Bitcoin fixes, what does that mean? It doesn't make any sense. Well, essentially, you know, when the government runs out of money to throw at government contractors where your incentives aren't to bark up the, the money printing tree, and all you have to do is satisfy some bureaucrat. And then all of a sudden you have this end endless flow of money. You can think about any type of government contractor uh, where it's like, wow, they got a lot of money. Uh, how did they do that? Well, they have one special customer and that's called the federal government, maybe the state, maybe the state government. You take that out, you take the power out of the fiat system and now it's all value for value. So the people that you trust are the ones who can actually bring value to you versus the ones who can essentially print money out of nowhere, essentially have the money tree. And it's, you know, these are, these are the kind of things that in a long roundabout way, Bitcoin fixes, but it's not clearly apparent to the people who aren't in Bitcoin on a regular base on a regular basis. Um, you know, I want to talk to you about, so we, t we talk about FEMA and we talk about their, uh, their lack of their lack of support for the local people 
maybe, you know, I've heard in the past that there's a black unmarked SUVs, even choppers going around unmarked, don't know where they come from, and they're messing with people's stuff. Um, I, I saw one video online where this black chopper came down and that was our parking um, lot. No, was, this, this, the save more parking lot in Burnsville, North Carolina. That, that was, that was our where it grazed and, and flew, had all those. Yeah. And you was, didn't know who the hell they were. I was literally out of the HLZ at that time when they came down we got, we started getting reports from, uh, those guys over to us that 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 had just happened and you know luckily somebody pulled out their phone and and took it all down and yeah um boy I'll i mean who, right who gets a helicopter like that like it it can't be just a random dude who wants to cause mayhem that's right um and so you start to go all right and and, and i will say you know at the time to play nice in the area and and not you know ruffle too many feathers and keep the local population somewhat calm um the the guys over the christian rangers uh decided that hey you know what best to say this is a pilot error um i will tell you from my own experience i would never you know land a helicopter in that parking lot you got, you've got poles everywhere you got people everywhere you got tents everywhere you got i mean just ridiculous and you know in, in terms of looking at an lz a lot of times what you'll do is you'll circle a couple times you'll you'll take a couple different angles of it and say oh you know what this is this is an easy thing to do when you've got an unmarked helicopter that comes in with rotor wash and and absolutely blast an entire parking lot and you know you've seen the video there's things are flying everywhere tents are flying they're hitting people they're they're you know the, the supplies that are on the ground and clothes everything else is flying all over the place um, you'd never, ever, ever land a, a bird in that parking lot under any of those circumstances, no, like not, not a chance. Um, so, and, you know, and having worked HLZs before, like, no, that this is not happening. So yeah, there, there is some, you know, what we call fuckery, uh, going on out there and, you know, yeah, there are unmarked vehicles casing us. Uh, luckily, you know, when you've got a bunch of green beret who are armed to the teeth and everything else that have taken a low visibility posture, they're not an easy target first and foremost. Right. Um, and secondly, they've got a ton of resources. Uh, and one of those resources is being able to find out who's who in the zoo. So if we suspected somebody, somebody, you know, would say, Hey, why don't you go, you know, walk around these vehicles, get a license plate. We'll come back to the trailer. We'll run it through Starlink um and figure it out and that was that was happening um you know more more than we'd like to admit it was but absolutely like the the government or somebody who was funded by the government was more concerned about what we were doing on the ground instead of coming up to us and being like hey thanks for being out here and thanks for doing everything you're doing no who are these guys let's start doing background checks let's start you know grabbing faces and things like that so that i don't know maybe you know, I'm sure we're on some extreme list now, but that's that's how they operate, man. We are we're a threat to how they make money. So that's how they go about it. You are demonetizing essentially the the government Ponzi scheme by providing value where they have their monopoly. And a lot of people at many different levels, whether you're a private contractor, whether you're all the way to the executive branch, they don't like it and yeah and it and it really highlights the opportunity cost that a lot of people never talk about you know these guys live in the mountains for a reason because they they don't like you know what the government is what it stands for they they hate being taxed um and at the end of the day they hate being taxed because they know that they're never going to see that money again even in an emergency situation and they literally just proved them right you know in, in an emergency situation who showed up their neighbor showed up their 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 fellow Appalachians showed up, you know, people came across the country all the way from Alaska that just showed up because they wanted to show up. You know who didn't show up? Federal government, a lot of times the state government. Um, I will say that, you know, the county and, and those guys, they were out there busting their butts with us and everything else. So um, but yeah, yeah, they were they were justified in, in everything that they've ever said, everything that they've ever felt towards the federal government being an absolute waste in bureaucracy. Well, you know, that's a perfect segue to the question I actually wanted to ask next. Um, are the people that desire to vote, and we know that some people just don't vote, um, 
are they going to be able to do this um, after after this natural disaster? You know, it's like whole, you know, infrastructure, you know, transportation infrastructure got wrecked. People's homes got wrecked. People have priorities now. Like when November 5th comes around, you know, is that going to be at the top of people's list or is it like they just got too much shit to do? What's going on? Um, you know, I mean, you have a mixed bag. I think uh, a lot of people are probably very motivated by this. And then uh, when I was leaving North Carolina the last time, I actually saw uh, some polling that was going on. And I think in 2020, uh, the polling for Republicans in, in North Carolina, especially during early voting, was about 10 points behind where Democratic voting was at that point. Um, this year, it was uh, almost neck and neck with the Republicans in, in a slight lead. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think it'd be a mixed bag. Um, I think there are a lot of people who are just absolutely amped up over this. And, you know, from talking to people out there, they, you know, they said, yeah, you know, I'm obviously going to the polls. Um, some who have not gone to the polls in a very long time. And some people, you know, from different parties, right? There, there are plenty of libertarians this time around. They're like, hmm. I'm not sitting this one out. I'm not voting for the libertarian. I'm actually going to go out and put my name towards Trump. And, you know, it, even in the fashion that I want to add to the voter count just to see how absolutely rigged the system is, because let's face it, if you get some people off the couch that haven't voted or libertarians to go vote for Trump, you, you're literally talking about a, an entire, you know, swath of people now that would never do such a thing that are making i don't want to say a compromise but they're they're showing up to say hey listen you know you we're going to be counted in this one way or another and we're going to add to the vote total to make sure that this other side of it just cannot be elected yeah it gives uh gives more voice to the or more punch to the silent majority yeah. um where a lot of these people you know i understand the libertarians you know there's a lot of a lot of you know if you're conservative in morals or economics the republicans have you know shown themselves to be not necessarily for the people uh before for their own pocketbooks and the and democrats democrats will democrat but the uh the limit <laughs> the libertarians on, hey this is sir ulrich's podcast you That's know right <clears throat> but you know the libertarians you know they have that they have that justification the five percent they can get 5%, they get like state funding for the next right. time around. So it's kind of like this low time preference where you're trying to get even the playing field for a possibility of, of a multi-party election. Um, but it seems like this year, you know, when you think about the one, the one possible candidate to do that in multiple states, uh, RFK, he said, man, you know, it's this election is too important for me and my own incentives. And I thought that he was that guy. It's like, oh yeah, he just wants to sell his yeah, book. Yeah. I released a video on Swan. I remember like the, your three election and I tried to, you know, give everyone, you know, their, you know, their punch in the punch in the gut. And my punch in the gut for RFK was, yeah, like, yeah, he just wants to sell his book. He doesn't really care about you guys. And it's like, but, and then last month or a month and a half ago, you know, it's like, hey, you know, make let's make America he healthy again. And it's like, okay, it seems like this is he's trying to make a change now. And yeah. Maybe you'll sell a book in four years. Well, I I think what you're seeing, um, and I've talked about this with a number of guys, is you're 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 literally living through the second American Revolution right now. And when when I say that, I don't say it flippantly, and I don't say it lightly. Um, we are at war. We've been at war for a long time, and I, and and when we look at what the stakes are right now for the people who are in charge, the people that, you know, probably pulled off the coup in 2020. If, if it doesn't go their way, you know, this could mean certain death for a lot of them. Um, and I mean that in, in the wholehearted sense, you know, when, when you're giving uh, aid to, you know, immigrants, especially immigrants that are coming in uh, to hurt people, th you know, through the FEMA funds, where we spent, you know, what was a hundred something million dollars on on these guys, and you don't have money left to, you know, to put towards actual hurricane relief, or you don't, you won't be able to get through the hurricane season. What you're literally doing is aiding and abetting 
a, a potential enemy of the United States in coming here and, and you know, seeking asylum, well, I say seeking asylum, but maybe even seeking to do harm. So, you know, there are there are case after case after case of, you know, the, the Democrats doing this. And when I say that, you know, their lives are literally on the line, you, I think people really need to understand what that means, because it doesn't matter, like whatever happens on November, what is it? Uh, the 5th, I, I think. November 5th. But whenever, yeah. whenever it all gets, you know, right. solved, because, you know, our, 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 <laughs> Our elections take two two weeks to figure out, whereas you know Taiwan or or Norway, you know they figure it out immediately. Or Argentina, who who just counted paper ballots in a day, and, you know within six Imagine. hours they had all the paper ballots. You know, and you're like, so when when this all goes down, I, I don't think you know people should just like lean back. You know, if Trump wins, um, don't expect the Democrats to go quietly. Don't expect you know any peaceful transition of power whatsoever, because you know what they claimed in terms of January six. I think you're going to see a nation erupt. I think, you know, they could weaponize TSA. I think they could weapon, like if you're flying somewhere, like I'm flying somewhere after that shortly and I'm, I'm a little worried about it, right? Like if you're one of those guys on a list and, you know, somebody at TSA wants to, you know, wrap you up and you've got a failing administration that's on its way out with treason charges. I mean, I, I know this is, you know, kind of worst case scenario, but when you look at, failing nations and failing parties that are, you know, somewhat communist. Uh, this is a lot of times what you get. So from the time we have the election till the time that Trump takes, takes off as possibly be on guard. Don't let your guard down for a second. Be safe. I would say if you don't have to travel, probably don't travel um, during that period. And, you know, just just be smart about your movement and, and, and being resourceful and, and having, you know, all your emergency supplies, you know, ready to go, because there could come a point um, that it gets pretty dicey here in America. You know, and not only that, but even if Trump wins, you know, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, even if Trump loses, there is a uh, there's a possibility when you look at the way when you look at elections in um, in foreign countries, you know. Part of the the strategy is to criminalize the populist candidate um, and, and all the followers and all the followers throw the book at them. Yeah. So after the non-populist group wins to the point where the next time an election comes, there is no competition. And so Trump and his followers are just are in just as much of a risk as you know, a losing left wing party, because guess what? I mean, Trump has already been indicted on all of these, all of these felony charges, and he's fighting them. And I don't think he's going to have an easy time fighting them uh, after the election is over. It'll probably be exponentially harder. And he may even potentially serve some major fines, if not jail time. I mean, you see how they tr they've treated Alex yeah. Jones and see how they treat all these different. That's that's the it's. It's lawfare, and it's a part of the overarching strategy that I say comes from comes from the Department of the State. Yeah, you know, and I, and I think you know these communists have obviously. Um, I I think what they've had to do is speed things up. Um, you know, there's Agenda 2030 and everything out there, where if you look at you know th this is where they wanted it to be by 2030. Well, they're not anywhere close to that point, and now you know we're we're literally butting up against it's do or die time. So if 2030 was do or die time and they're five years early, I think they've sorely under underestimated the American people because I said it in a tweet a while back. It's like, look, it doesn't matter if Kamala wins or Trump wins, nobody is going to accept, you know, whoever the winner is on the other side. So if you're, you know, if you're in a populated area, you might want to consider maybe not being in a populated area if you can if you can get out of those places that's probably one of the number one things i'd say to anybody if you're not married to a place for a job and it is densely populated with maybe um the people that would riot then you know think think about other things um but yeah i mean there's there's obviously also the the geopolitics at stake here where when we're starting to look at ukraine and the middle east right now which is heating up you know Xi Jinping. 
um, and Russia are closer than ever. BRICS obviously just had their you know uh, announcement that I, there's hundreds of countries now um, that are joining uh, the the BRICS association with a failing dollar. What what we're looking at possibly in in the Middle East in terms of war, um, you know, could be one of those things where if they you know the current administration does lose, you know, they they just create chaos. And whether it's it's you know, I would say expect that it's going to be both international and domestic. Uh, because what would you do if you were a communist? It was like, oh, you know what? All right, if we're out of here, here's this flaming bag of shit and peace. Good luck. We'll see you in four years again. Uh, maybe, you know, and so I, uh, I, I think, I think we're in for a very interesting winter. Um, and you know, I, I, not to be a doomer and a gloomer, but this is just the reality of politics when you have failing currencies, failing parties and possible coups. Yeah. And, and then I do want to get back to FEMA uh, for a minute or the okay. storm for a minute. But before I go, you know, it's funny that you say that, you know, what will what do fail? What do losing uh, political bodies do? What do losing parties do um, for the sake of um, for the sake of survival or or compromising the winning party? You know, it's no longer about, you know, the for the country. And, you know, it's for hey, if I can't win, no one's going to win. But when you think about, I, I go to Brazil and, you know, X and Elon Musk has his whole presence down there has been censored for the sake of has been shut down for the sake of, for the sake of, one party versus another. And this this uh, current administration in Brazil, uh, they've shown themselves to be very very supportive of China. Um, Thai, I mean, obviously Brazil moving closer and closer to their BRICS relationship. They're the B in BRICS. Yep. And oh, the United States has had insane amount of presence down there. And they have, they have their ties down there. And, but for some reason they can't use their ties to support, um, to support an American company, American company that promotes civil liberties. Uh, and they would essentially allow that they, the United States, will allow X to be silenced, Starlink to be silenced, and Brazil is now working with China to get the the competing Chinese version of Starlink up in Brazil. And it's like you have all these ties, you have all this relationship, Department of State, and you rather let Brazil fall to the Chinese Chinese influence than support actual freedom of speech. You rather enable censorship in order pretty much to to create a world of control and it doesn't matter who is in control as long as people are controlled it's not freedom is no longer valued uh by any um by any state department it's really it's really scary yeah um i think you know this approach is a topic um where you start to look at who you have in control of the bureaucracies right the state department the undersecretary of the state department the secretary of the state department are all israeli um, and, you know, we can go down the list of, of what's happening within um, the intelligence apparatus here in the United States, also uh, controlled by as an Israeli. The CIA is controlled by as an Israeli. You've got DHS, uh, Alejandro Mayorkas, who is also an uh, Israeli. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I say this as they have dual citizenship. They're not obviously like, but let's for, for the sake of it, when you have over 75 percent of a cabinet that controls the most um prestigious most powerful bureaucracies here in america um there's there's some things that you can glean from that if you understand some of the points of view of a guy named benjamin netanyahu um and you know he is on record talking about how you know obviously we have assets and control over the U.S. Congress, over the U.S. Senate, over the U.S. bureaucracies. We can bend their will through all of the media, which, by the way, all the major you know companies, all of what, six, seven of them uh, are owned almost wholly by Israelis. And then you have BlackRock, who owns all the shares, the controlling shares of these companies, who is the entire board is Israeli. And so you, you start to paint this picture one of the things that um, you know, if you if you kind of go through the history of what their plans were for America, was to basically, you know, over time chop it up and sell it off. And you know, who are you going to sell it off to? 
China's buying. China's buying a lot of land around here. They bought a lot of land around mm -hmm. military bases. I got that question when I was in, you know, the governor's seat, and I, it's, I had to go and I was like, "Are they really doing this?" Sure as hell they are. Um, kind of had to change my tune on that one, and it's something that I, you know, kind of had to look back and go, "Hmm, maybe Americans should be the only people who can buy property in America." Like, I don't know. In terms of security, it seems like that would be a good start, but. Yeah, the, the chopping up and selling of different parts of America to different, you know, uh, parts of the world, and you start to look at, you know, what kind of what happened in North Carolina uh, with BlackRock owning the, you know, the mineral rights to a mine out there that has, you know, a bunch of quartz that they can't get in any other part of the world. And you start to start, you kind of start to go, oh, this isn't maybe just a conspiracy, like they're literally in action moving around the world. Uh, with a Belt and Road Initiative, buying up as much as they can, and this takes us right back to Bitcoin. Is you know they're they're doing this with a fiat currency that they print out of thin air that the United States government continues to accept, and you know that's that's one of the biggest problems I think with with fiat is you know it doesn't you're in a fiat war of printing, and in the meantime you've got corrupt politicians who are you know, selling off land or brokering deals or condemning land, um, you know, through all sorts of means to have that land, you know, moved to foreign organizations or foreign people. And that's obviously a, a huge uh, risk for the United States. Are we going to have an epic part two or what? Um, <laughs> I I can, see, I can see it's like drifting. It's like, you know, one more thing before we go back to the storm. And it's like, and then it's, uh, we're going to have part two soon, but I do, you know, I don't even want to touch that one yet. I got to ask this question. This may be even more conspiratorial or, or than all the things we're talking about. When we talk, when I look at the, the path of those storms, both of them, you know, I can't help but think, you know, they really did avoid. And you said they hit the places that were most resilient in terms of dealing with the storm because yeah. you have all these special forces living in the mountains not wanting to bother anyone and they knew their area more than some person in a georgia apartment building uh, in a, a, an atlanta apartment building knows his you know knows his liquor store around the corner so cloud seeding like is there a possibility that these storms were guided to essentially hurt a demographic, a geographical group of people that could potentially hurt the the establishment. Yeah, I mean, non-zero probability. What we call yeah. this is target softening in in the Marine Corps and the, in the rest of the military. Right? Is you do a bombardment for days, maybe weeks, um, and that target softening when ground forces finally come in, and you got your you know low flying air assets and things like that that are coming in to take over. An area, it's it's much easier to do so. So, um, yeah, you know, they've been manipulating weather for over fifty years. They've they've probably gotten pretty good at it. There are obviously some anomalies. You can go back and you can look at the radar. Some people will blow it off and be like, "Oh, that's just Doppler." Um, it looks literally like you know they're they're playing with lasers um, <laughs> out there, right? Like it looks like it. Um, and when you start to understand kind of the mechanics of a hurricane, I'm not a weatherman, but you know, I've I've lived in the South long enough. I've watched these things. You know, dropping barometric pressure is one thing that you have to have to strengthen a storm. These storms are being flown in by you know certain organizations with you know DOD markings, right? Mm. And they're going out and they're taking measurements around the eye of the storm. Well, here's the thing: is if you're taking measurements and maybe doing something else where you can steer a storm, whether it's dropping barometric pressure or inducing you know, some sort of element that will drop barometric pressure in those areas while strengthening it over hot water. Like I'm a knuckle dragging Marine and I understand like, okay. And then all you have to do is then blaze a path, right? Like, and, and you can do this through heat, which is laser energy. And it doesn't take mm -hmm. a ton of it. You know, it, you know, we're talking, you know, maybe a couple hundred Watts worth of laser energy that would show up on a Doppler as you know, possibly something because it's doing, you know, things like vaporizing a lot of the droplets that are in the air, right? So like when you have these 
very powerful lasers, it's possible that you could even steer a, a hurricane. And if that's in fact what they did, where they dumped three years worth of rain mm. on a specific place within you know a matter of days, man, if this ever gets out that they did something like this and it's confirmed and there's whistleblowers, which in failing systems, there's whistleblowers who want to make deals and there are people who can't live with themselves for consciousness. Mm. Like, you know, non-zero chance or non-zero, which means possibly, and if you're talking about the most evil, satanic, pedophilic, type of organizations that we're up against, obviously, in this fight. I mean, would you put it past them? I I'm, I wouldn't put it past them. And I got to oh. tell you, you know, to, to see two hurricanes come off of the Yucatan Peninsula the way they <laughs> did and not start out in the Atlantic like I've ever, I've seen most other hurricanes. I mean, the majority of other hurricanes in my life start out. Well, you know, I guess you can draw your own conclusions. You're going to upset all the people who worship their state-owned God. Do you understand that this is some people's divine presence, you know, the government, and and imagine that they would do horrible, bad things to us to keep us under their control? Could you imagine? Yeah, they're, they're called retards. Uh, any, any, <laughs> any, uh, and, and I take that back. You know, there are people who are retarded that are not that retarded. You know what I mean? <laughs> and that's, that's yeah, if you still trust government after, you know, the, the 2020 COVID. All of uh, this. And man, you're just like, what are you doing? What are you doing indeed? Um, one more question. And then I just want to, we're going to cut this episode off and move on to part two. But when we look at this, response to the, to uh, this this d disaster um we see fema and we see their failures and even their even their diabolical intentions to to hold on to their power at the at the at the expense of people who actually need their services do you see a a good path for removing that authority and bringing it to the state level or the local level, and one thing at a time, do you see a, a, a good path for bringing FEMA to Georgia, bringing FEMA to California, bringing FEMA to, you know, Tennessee? Uh, I, yeah, I mean, I think it's gotta be homegrown to a certain degree. Um, you know, the days of, you know, centralization and anything in, in these situations is I think their biggest downfall. Um, centralization of government obviously doesn't work. Centralization of money doesn't work. Centralization of healthcare doesn't work. Centralization doesn't work because what you're talking about is now we're setting a rule base for a populace that is, you know, non-homogenous. And, you know, for, for me, you know, I, I think, you know, what I personally will do with the situation and what we've already started scheduling is going and meeting with the local representatives, the local sheriff, the local uh, fire departments, and, and doing a debrief with them. And, and hey, these are our after actions from what we experienced up there. These are the things that we should be doing in terms of, you know, making sure that if a disaster or any other situation pops up where we need communications, we need first aid, we need distribution points, we need to manage uh, volunteers and things like that, like these are the things that we can use from from the jump, like right now, and that'll mean saving lives. So I think this is one of those things that Bitcoiners are, you know, and, and, and people who are in Freedom Tech all together are uniquely positioned to lead their communities into, um, you know, here at Bitcoin Veterans, I think this is, you know, this is going to be part of the mission is not, you know, we're not doing disaster relief. What we're doing is disaster preparedness. And the thing is, is most of us, obviously are going to be doing this out of our own pocket and going out and trying to make sure that we're growing our community um, the way it needs to during this transitionary period in history. Great, great thoughts from you. Uh, you know, there's an old saying from an old R&B song, you stay ready, you ain't got to get ready. Um, right. Shane, I don't want to say goodbye because we're going to see you in another episode, part two. And we're going to film that immediately after this one. Thank you for joining me for part one. So Shane Hazel with his experience with uh, in the Georgia mountains in the in the North Carolina, um, the North Carolina mountains, the Georgia fields, uh, helping people out uh, during uh, Hurricane Helene. Uh, some very insightful, eye opening revelations.
Uh, we're going to talk about in part two his endeavors into politics, um, the November 5th election, what it means for you, what it means for uh, the people of America, what it means for the world. I'm Sir Ulrich, like my father before me. Tune in next time for part two with Shane Hazel.